Okay, the um, TJ40 DC receiver project is uh, approaching conclusion. We've, the students, some of the students have built all, all four boards and are ready to do the kind of final assembly integration of the boards. And um, we think within the next month or so, some of these receivers will be coming on the air. We hope that by the end of the semester, all 15 of them will be receiving. Uh, students have learned quite a bit. It's amazing to, sit, to see them sit there putting um, building circuits from schematics on Manhattan boards as if it's the most natural thing in the world. It's really quite remarkable. Anyway, what we're doing now is we're starting to think about when we send them home with their receivers, what kind of antennas should we suggest that they build? Now, obviously, they're not going to put 40-meter hex beams up on the roof. We think that a lot of these kids um, live in either apartments or townhouses and probably won't have a lot of outside space available. And they're probably going to set this thing up in um, probably in their bedrooms on a on a dresser or something near close to a window. So we've been kind of scratching our heads thinking about what kind of antenna to recommend. And what we've come up with is just a uh, a quarter wave piece of wire with a um, a counterpoise connected to ground. And that's what we've been building. Dean gave me about a thousand feet of number twenty two insulated wire which has been really helpful so I've I built an antenna today and I'm using my my son's old bedroom up on the second floor of our house which I think it gives us a pretty good uh, kind of simulation of, of the kind of um, room situation that the students might be faced when they take these receivers home so let me just just show you what we did I, I just threw there's no coax involved no antenna tuners or anything like that it's just um, a 33-foot piece of wire going straight out the window out to uh, to a tree. And it's sort of, you'll see it. it. Let me just show you here. You can see it. The sun is shining on it, which is pretty good. You can see where it is. There it goes. I hope it's showing up right there. Okay, there it goes. You can see it goes out to the tree. And uh, right out the window, and it comes in here. And then, boom, it comes in this way. So I'm going to... Put this on the stand here and show you how it, how the, the effect of uh, of connecting the the antenna and the ground on this receiver are. All right, so this is the connection to the to the antenna, and this is the connection to the counterpoise. I'll remove the counterpoise for now, so there's no counterpoise, and, and I'm also going to remove the antenna right now. And we'll just fire up the receiver. I'll just take the little nine volt battery and plug it in. You can hear a very little bit of band noise. Not too much. It's uh, about 5.25 in the afternoon on Wednesday, the 29th of March. So 40 should be starting to wake up in the afternoon here. But watch what happens when I hook up the antenna to the input port of the bandpass filter. You know, an immediate increase. You can hear the band noise, even on this tiny little speaker here. But I think the real big change comes when you hook up the counterpoise. Now you start hearing stuff. Look down the CW, look at that. Let me turn off the counterpoise and show you what happens. That's without the counterpoise. A lot of people think that the counterpoise is not necessary, but I think it is, especially if you're in a situation like this where you don't really have a ground connection. There's no ground really on this thing. But but the, the counterpoise, the, the other quarter wavelength of wire, 33 feet, really serves as the ground. Now I don't have it hooked up to anything. When I first was doing this, I just had 33 feet of wire spread out on the floor around here as the counterpoise, and it worked almost as well. But look at that, big, a big difference. And then of course, when you remove the antenna, boom, gone, nothing. So you put the antenna on, you can start hearing the really, really strong signal, but it's not too strong, but then you put up the counterpoise, 
Boom, it's very strong. We'll tune through the band here a little bit. Let me go back here so you can see what we're doing. So here's the, um, I'll move it over here so you can see my hand too, I guess. Let me get myself oriented here. Yeah, so I think you can see both. Now I've got the uh, antenna and the, the counterpoise hooked up. I'm taking the screw in so we're going up in frequency. You see kind of a similar effect if I remove the counterpoise here, way down. And the counterpoint, the counterpoise really helps a lot. Because when you think about it, radio signals from the antenna are coming in through here and they're hitting the, this coil here, right up in here. And if there's no place for the, for, the, for, the, for the signal to go, it's not gonna put much of a current through there. The counterpoise provides a low impedance path it simulates the ground, and it works quite a bit, quite well. So we got the SSB signals here. Coming up to, towards the top of the band here, we're probably getting into starting to hear shortwave broadcast stations here. You can hear the AM heptadines. So let's go back. We're going back down through 40 meters now as I turn the screw. Forty's not completely recovered from the daylight. In the evening will be better. We're alerting the students that 40 is sort of temperamental in that you get high absorption around midday and the band seems to go away. We don't want them taking the receivers home, cranking it up on, you know, on a Saturday at noon and then being disappointed by not hearing too much. We're telling them, you know, early morning, early evening, we'll do a lot better. down the CW portion of the band now. That's probably W1AW cranking out. Code practice. But again, remove the, remove the counterpoise. It drops off quite a bit. Put the counterpoise back on. Comes up quite a bit. You can go zero beat. That's zero beat. Look, so zero beat means we're right at the center. Up one side, up the other side, we're at zero beat. Go up a little bit higher. We probably should hear FT8. FTH right there, it's probably 7074 megahertz or 7074 kilohertz, 
7.074 megahertz. Yeah, there's the FTA signals. Watch when I take off the, the counter. We take the counterpoise off. It's, it almost just dis, they disappear. Or they might have disappeared on their own. <laughs> Anyway, that's where we are. So the students will have completed the, um, the variable frequency oscillator or the PTO. They will have built the mixer and the diplexer. They will have built the, uh, the bandpass filter. And finally, this week, they're gonna be, two, two, two teams have already completed the audio amplifier. And uh, we're gonna take those two teams and have them put the boards together Make sure that they're using solder wick to connect the boards and then not a lot of coax we don't want to have to get a, get into a lot of making coaxial cables just put the input close to the output and the boards should go together pretty much like legos and then you'll end up with i think a pretty capable 40 meter direct conversion receiver that they will have built themselves in a very I mean, they, they have built it. I mean, we, we watch them. We don't sit there. We don't step in and don't intervene. We don't build it for them. They build it. And for me, I think the most um, memorable experience was, was in the last session where the students were building the audio frequency amplifier. Many of the teams were just sitting there with the schematic kind of, they, they stuck the schematic on the, on the solder fans that they have at the workstation. So the, the suction from the solder fan was holding up the schematic, probably not doing the solder smoke suction very good, but very much good, but they could see the schematic. And then working from the schematic, they were taking parts and putting them on the Manhattan board. And I, I said to the teacher, I said, the fact that they're using Manhattan boards at all is, is amazing. And the fact that they're just reading schematics and building the circuits from the schematics, it's really more, more amazing. I mean, I think these days, most of the time, all we hope for from uh, from young builders is to to stuff parts on a on a PC board that comes out of some kit factory somewhere, and they stuff the parts on the board. They don't really know what they do, and they just say, "Yeah, well, okay, I stuffed the board." You know, a pick and a pick and place could do that just as well, or better. In this case, though, they're actually building the circuitry and. Uh, and trying to understand how it works. And our, our objective in this was that when the receiver is built, if the students think about it just a little bit, they'll be able to say what every single component on all four of these boards does. So they'll have a pretty deep understanding of how the radio works. And, uh, and of course, all the knowledge that comes from having actually built it themselves. We're also preparing for them a list of mods that they might want to consider because we don't want this to be the end of the construction process. We think that they should take these things home and start thinking about mods that they might, might want to make. What, what, how might they might, might, might want to modify these things? Each one of the boards has a list of modifications that they should consider or can consider doing. And we think that would be, be really, really good for them. And, uh, you know, the other thing we were talking about is what happens if you know, each team has three or four students, and what happens if one of the students is decided that he or she is going to take the, the receiver home, and the other the others would like one, but don't have it because, well, I mean, they could share it, they could pass it around, but also, you know, we've given them the knowledge to to build one of these things, and they could, you know, they could churn out another one, make another one. The parts are all there; we have extra parts, so they could just build another one if somebody really wanted it. Um, 
one of the things that we're, we're, we're going to encourage also at the end is that, you know, um, we're, spring break is upon us, and, and so school is going to be closed for a while, so we're, there's going to be a, a period of several weeks where we're not able to go in and, and work with the students. But what we're going to tell them is they're, they're at the point now in their construction abilities where they really don't need us. They can they could come in and work on these boards on their own. So those those who have to catch up, the reason they have to catch up is because there were other school activities that took them away from this project. It's completely understandable. But now that they want to catch up, they can they could just come in if they have a half hour at lunchtime, go into the lab and put a few parts on the board, and, you know, and build this thing the way the way many of us built these things when we were working and only had limited limited time. One point that we're making with the students, though, is that they do need to get it done. And we're kind of gently reminding them that they don't want to be, they don't want to be that person who almost finished, almost finished an important school project. There's no reason why all of them can't finish this. And so that's, that's our objective is to get them all to finish. And uh, even if that involves working on their own a little bit without us, we'll come back towards the end of April and uh, and help them through it. We've also let them know how they can communicate with us if they run into serious kind of log jams in the process during the period of our, our absence. Anyway, we're having a lot of fun with this. We've learned a lot. Dean and I were talking, even the as the, the instructors, you know, you always learn, learn more than the students. And that's certainly the case here. We've learned a lot about um, about this receiver and the circuit that, that we developed for it. Uh, we kind of like the circuit. We've resisted pressures to make it more complicated. We've resisted pressures to include integrated circuit technology and, and other things, and we've kept it really, really very, very basic. And uh, I think that's, that's a useful, useful part of this whole exercise. Anyway, we'll keep you posted. We'll let you know what's going on in, uh, in the future. Uh, parts of this build but for now here we are there's our receiver there's a front panel they're going to come up with nicer front panels I think and hopefully they'll be able to take these things home and, and do all kinds of interesting things with them one of the things we've been saying is that they should um, download FL Digi and then use it to kind of take the audio output from some of the digital signals, decode them. We're also making a provision for them to use headphones. Got these little Amazon headphones and we figured out a way to, to come up with a simple and easy connector to put them in there where the, the higher impedance of these headphones is not gonna cause problems with the receiver. We think we've We've cracked the code on that one. At each juncture, there's this kind of challenge of coming up with a solution that's simple enough, easy enough, but effective enough. You want to keep it simple, but like Einstein said, not too simple. <laughs> All right, 7-3 from Northern Virginia.